personally wanted to talk to you about brushes today, but Ross asked me to talk to you about the primary colours again and the difference between the Winton colours and the artist quality colours, which as you know is a big issue. Um, I think from a teaching point of view, I, I always have problems with people with brushes because they bring in these really cheap brushes from, um, I don't know, I don't want to mention their names, but and then they expect to do really great paintings out of them. So I have an issue with people getting the right brushes. So if I can in this micro session, I would like to cover that a little bit at the very end. Um, and the very first thing I would say about that is if I could just divide this micro session into um, three basic parts, which is not long enough at all, by the way, to talk about any of the things I want to talk about. But if I can expand your knowledge base, you can pass that on to your customers. But even if any, if any of you are interested in the painting itself, if painting itself is something that you do, how many people are interested <coughs> in painting, by the way? So have you done oil painting before? <laughs> See, um, I feel myself that in teaching acrylic for years and years and before that watercolour, um, I personally have gone back to oils. As, as Helen knows, I painted it with oils when I was about 12 or 13 or 14 years of age simply because my father, God rest him, bought me a gorgeous set of artist quality colours when I knew no different. Because he just said to the person who was selling them, he said, look, I want the best quality paints, give me whatever you got. And he didn't realise he was going to have to starve the rest of my family for the two or three <laughs> weeks afterwards to get the artist quality. So my point is that I started off with these fantastic colours when I was very young, and I haven't kind of de devi deviated from them. I've kind of come back to them again. So I've done the whole acrylic thing. I love acrylics to, bit, to bits. I think they're great and they're versatile and all that. It's just that my personal love is oils because they're so versatile. And because um, they're even at sort of the age that I am, I am which is not going to go on camera, <laughs> um, I'm still learning about oils. So there's no way you're going to learn everything in 20 minutes. I can only just give you some of the very basics. But I really do want to talk to you about brushes before the end of the session because it's something that drives me insane when somebody comes into an art class or they come down to carry for a workshop or something and they feel that they should be able to do the stuff that they I want them to be able to do with terrible brushes. So can we come back to that please and just remind me before we finish up as well. So why would you spend um, 35 euros or 38 euros or even 42 euros in some places on cobalt violet here um, and just not buy sort of 35 colours in the other range, you know what I mean? Um, and I've been trying to explain that for the last five sessions, so just bear with me if I seem to be re repeating myself. Um, these colours, by the way, the Winton colour range, having been painting and teaching for about 40 years odd, they're still fabulous colours. And I just think that sometimes in an effort to kind of promote the artist's quality colours, we can forget how great they <coughs> really are. I've, um, I've used all sorts of paints from um, the Reeves paints to the old Masters paints and some of the Sennelli air colours and so on. And they're all great paints. But the Winton colours for the price, and they're a generic price, they're still the tops for me as far as I'm concerned. To the point that even when my daughter was starting off oil painting a couple of months ago, um, she started off with the Winton colours, the full range of them. So um, it's really hard to promote the artist's quality colours from the point of view of wanting a range of colours. So you can't really just, you know, uh, justify that. Um, having said that, and having moved from that place of uh, wanting cheap colours and so on, the reason why these are so expensive um, is because they encapsulate in a tube, I suppose, 500 years of tradition. You're <coughs> buying minerals, you're buying cobalts from the earth, you're buying cadmiums from the earth, you're buying oxides which have been ground. You're not just buying um, a, a colour that's been produced in a chemistry, chemical lab, which a lot of these are, and a lot of them have some of the same chemical uh, similarities as these ones. But the higher up the scale you go from series two to series four, you're buying pr basically precious gems which have been ground down. And I think that that will become clearer to you as you move through the whole thing. It's not just the snob value of that either from the point of view it's tr traditionally those are the colours that uh, you know the people had started with. I can give you some very interesting information about the actual colours themselves. You know, one one of my most interesting ones is Indian yellow. Does anybody know where that came from? Indian yellow is a colour that was very popular um, in the 1800s um, by a lot of the artists, especially the artists in the Impressionist era, by the way. 
that wanted a beautiful daffodil yellow. Um, but it's actually um, a colour that was derived from feeding mango plants to um, cows in India, collecting their urine and making pellets out of the urine and then selling it with oil <laughs> dilutants um, to make Indian yellow, which is where it came from, Indian yellow. And now it's basically just produced chemically. So can you imagine the work that went into doing that? I would not like to do that for a job. Um, ivory black, for instance, was, uh, is bone, animal bone, which in its basic premise was used just as white. It was the best thing that they could get, the closest thing to pure carbon. So it was white, used white. When it was incinerated, then the ashes were um, actually black. So that, that balance of black and white came from the same bone. On one point you had white, and on another when it was incinerated, it became um, ivory black. So those colours were actually one of the main palette colours that we'd say from the 15th and 16th century on. So they're very interesting, the, the, the history of paint that you're talking about in these tubes, you know. Um, I can go on and on and on. Indigo, one of my favourite colours actually, indigo, <coughs> is actually, um, was a mistake. A guy called Despatch was trying to make a pink, a purple, chemically. He was a colourist working in the 17th century in uh, Switzerland. And he was trying to make um, a pinky, purpley shade and he ended up um, putting in a small bit of animal fat by mistake into the, the colours, into the linseed oil that he was mixing and it became um, darker and darker, it just kept getting darker and darker and he actually ended up with the first chemical synthesised colour which was called indigo and now it's not made from wood anymore which, um, which is very interesting, it's just made chemically so an awful lot of these colours are actually produced chemically but the history behind them is amazing because people didn't just go into a shop in those days and buy tubes of paint so I suppose one of the things I like about the artist's quality colours is that they retain some of the, the, the minerals from the earth the oxides from the earth, the ores from the earth but also the professionalism of mixing them to the high quality so the history of them is always there with me when I'm painting myself you know, the, the luminosity of the colours as well so on that subject of um, luminosity and versatility, I wanted to talk to you about um, just very basically, see I could go in 10 different directions right now um, and I really just want to concentrate on some of the things that I felt were of impact to the previous people that were coming here. So for instance you're going in, you're buying a primary colour, I've said to you in the past, in the last few sessions that I've been to over the last few years is that when people come into the shop they should get a set of primary colours, they shouldn't just get kind of like what other people put into a set. You know, you should get the best primary primaries that you can because you can get an extensive range from those primaries. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about the Winton colours or the artist quality, but in particular with the artist quality you get a much broader range of bright colours from um, the base colours from, uh, from the primary range. So that's, that's just first off. When you're dealing with the artist quality colours, you're dealing with more clear minerals and pigments. When you're dealing with the Winton colours, you still have a certain amount of pigment in them, but you have fillers and they're more chemically derived. And they're, they're more toothpastey to work with, which is fine when you're a student. I just included this painting because it's my daughter's second one, and I'm promoting the fact that she didn't do a bad job. Um, <laughs> she's um, using just the Winton colours, and she just loves the fact that you can get the beautiful turquoises and greens and so on from that range. But uh, when you're even working within the range of artist quality, I'm just going to forget about the Winton for the second because I think that that's their, they kind of speak for themselves. They're great, great paints and you can't actually overestimate how great they are. But when you're talking about the artist quality colours and primary colours in particular, people don't realise that you actually, um, the higher up the scale that you go in the series, um, the more pure the colours are. And I'm going to explain that to you right now. So sometimes you pay 30 or 40 euros for, say, a transparent yellow, and you'd only pay something like 7 or 8 or 9 euros for Series 1 or Series 2 Windsor Lemon. So if somebody comes in and they really want to use artist quality, OK, the Windsor Lemon is great. But the transparent yellow um, is the one that uh, is, has more versatility within itself. So it's a purer pigment. So I want to cho uh, just explain that to you right now. So if I have... Um, if I have a Windsor yellow or a Windsor lemon, I'm going to get a brush now, not my finger anymore, because I'm just tired of using my finger. Um, if I s so this is Windsor yellow and Windsor lemon. There's very little difference between them, isn't there? Can you see them there? Mm -hmm. And I have a transparent yellow over here. 
Initially, the transparent yellow looks like a cadmium. Can you see it? And you kind of think to yourself, well, that's a bit uh, gamboji looking for me. It's a bit sort of on the orange scale of things, but it's like um, a chili spice in terms of the culinary act art of mixing colours. If I add white to this, I'm going to get lemon yellow anyway, or Windsor yellow. If I add a lot of white to it, I'm going to get um, nicotinamide type lemon yellow. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. If I add a little bit more, I'm going to get um, the, the, just the, uh, that color there. If I add a little bit of any of the burnt siennas, madder browns or whatever, my, my own special favorite is burnt sienna, by the way, but I'll explain something more to you in that. Um, if I bring in um, burnt sienna into the transparent yellow, I'm going to get all kinds of gold ochres. The more of the burnt sienna I put into it, I'm going to get something like a raw sienna. Um, I can still get something like that with those colours, but I won't get the purity of the colour because it's not a primary pigment. So am I try I'm just like, trying to explain to you that sometimes 60% of what you have on your sets can all come from some of the better choice of colours. And my, unfortunately, transparent yellow is, is kind of a pricey one, but because I love it so much, I make sure that all my students kind of have that in their palette because you can get so many other colours from it. Now, that's um, the transparent yellow. I can sort of sell that to death sometimes, the transparent yellow, and then people can kind of say, like, why did she go on and on about it? It's just that, do you see this um, sap green here? It's not actually sap green. So it's just, again, it's my transparent yellow, and it has a tiny little bit of indigo in it. And I'm just going to put the indigo out there if I can find it. So this is just a bit of indigo there. And indigo is such an important colour when you're starting off because some people get the titanium white right, but a lot of people get black, which is not a good idea. Um, I would always invest in indigo. So if you have somebody wanting to get the primary colours, make, make sure that you have indigo on your set of colours because it's a transparent black. With a little bit of brown in it, it becomes like um, a charcoal or um, a lamp black or an ivory black without losing anything and with a little bit more of the mediums in it it becomes a lovely translucent kind of a blue so indigo again it's not a popular one because some of the sets have lamp black and ivory black but it's because of its again because of its transparent nature when i mix it with a transparent yellow it becomes sap green so ergo you don't need sap green chrome greens and a lot of other the other greens on your set as well now i realize people are going to buy them anyway and that's great but i just want you to know what you can do to direct people if that was a solid black mass, like lamp black or ivory black, it, wouldn't, it would have a much denser colour and the colours would not actually look like sap green, like the glaze that you need from a sap green. Also, um, in terms of the Winton colour contrast, this is um, a green coming out of the tube, which is a basic colour which most people would go out and buy. Um, it's a lovely colour. She's used it in her palette there. And it's just a permanent green light sort of a tone there. It's very, very opaque, very toothpastey. But again, with any of these yellows, not just the transparent yellow, but even with the cheaper range of the artist's quality colours, if I mix them with um, some of my well thought out primaries, like a manganese blue, for instance, which is gorgeous, by the way, look at it. Let me just stretch it out for you. Um, manganese blue would be um, a tallow range. It's a, it's a gorgeous uh, sea blue. It's not something that a lot of people would choose, but in my book, it would be one of the most important colours to have, as well as the French ultramarine. So if I mix that a tiny bit of it um, with any of the yellows, again, it doesn't have to be the transparent yellow, I'm going to get a lovely green, which is transparent enough to match that. So it's, it's, if I stretch this out, I'm not going to get anything more than just the green. But if I've got the right choice of primary colours from the artist's range with the glaze that you can get from them, I can extend my range. So I think... That kind of knowledge can go on and on and on when you're starting to talk about it. Um, what I've asked um, Hills, Hills to do is to send a sheet of paper around with information because I did write and print out. I want to go through this with you for two minutes just because it goes through different colours that you may or may not be aware of. One final thing about the transparent yellow before I give up on that because I've just realised I didn't do it. Um, do you see this bright red here? Which colour from the range do you think that would be? No, it's actually permanent rose. So if I have the transparent yellow again, 
Obviously, if I use the Windsor lemon or the cadmium yellow or any of those other yellows, which are also gorgeous, but if I use my transparent yellow, which I'm going to try and get a pure bit of the transparent yellow again, um, and I use permanent rose, which is a primary color, one of the fav my favorite primary colors, you're going to get a gorgeous bright red. And if I add more of the yellow to it, I'm going to, get, I'm going to end up with a Windsor orange if I keep going which is another one of my all-time favorite colors from the tube, by the way, is a Windsor orange. So you get the idea that mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, the, the higher the series um, you have, the more you can actually extend your palette. For I know that starting off, some people just want to buy the basics, and of course the Winton are great, but you should know yourselves that um, transparent yellow, indigo, permanent rose, manganese blue, French ultramarine, they are great colours for people to start off with because you can't actually, um, there's a lot of things you can do with them that you can't do, for instance, if you just buy a burnt umber. So just let me just close the book there, even though I could go on for another few hours about the whole thing about those primary colours and talk about my own, one of my own favourite colours on the palette and the reason why it's my favourite colour on the palette. Just a small subsection of this part of the demo would be to explain that if a customer comes in and they're looking to do just basic colour mixing and so on and they're just starting off, obviously they'll be learning an awful lot about primary colours anyway. But if somebody comes in and they want to do, um, say for instance, landscape paintings, I have made a list here that I've g I'm going to give to Helen and Ross. And basically, these are the colours that you should be pointing people in in the direction of. So if I'm doing a landscape painting, for instance, on top of this range of colours that I've just called out, um, you'd be asking them to buy things like Terra Verta, because it has beautiful um, a range for distant mountains and so on. Cobalt blue for skies, which I've just pointed out with these colour tones here. Naples yellow deep for all sorts of um, buff titaniums, which I'm going to explain to you right now. Um, olive green is a great one as well. Davies grey. I mean, I hate spending money on greys, but that, that thing has just got, that's the greatest thing ever. Davies grey is just the best thing ever. You should promote that as much as possible. Because having talked about lovely bright primaries, Davies grey is one of those colours that mutes everything down without actually changing its nature. It doesn't make it darker. It doesn't make it um, more charcoal-y like Payne's grey. It actually mutes colour. So when I'm trying to get a colour and I'm trying to mute it and maybe make it slightly more shadowy, I would start putting in a bit of Davies Grey into the colour. It doesn't actually blacken it. It's not like a charcoal or a carbon-based colour. I don't know what's in that thing, but it just makes everything the right colour. When I'm in an art class and I can't think of how to mix up the colour, I'll always just go to Davies Grey. It's a grey that's like a pewter colour in, the, in its nature, and it just makes everything um, subdued. It's not all about bright colours, by the way. Um, so those are the colours. And sap green, of course, which I told you you can get from um, indigo and lemon yellow. Um, if you're doing the portraiture thing and the figurative thing, which is huge now, everybody wants to be able to do portraitures and figurative stuff, and you just can't get it with flesh colour. I don't know what, where that colour came from, the flesh colour, but um, there was an old colour that used to be on the market, and I asked um, Hills if they'd give me some of it. That's not the end of the session, is it? I'm just going to keep going. Um, it's called Terra Rosa. It's very like uh, burnt sienna. Uh, I have it here somewhere, and it's it's um, it's just friend, uh, flesh colour. They're going to they need a new tablecloth, by the way, because I've got specks of colour all over it. But I'll just get rid of them. They're going to kill me. Um, I just wanted to point out to you that uh, if your customer, for instance, is doing um, paintings with uh, figurative work, that's terra rosa. If, if I just put white into terra rosa, I'm going to get flesh colour anyway. But it also gives me all the other gorgeous colours that I need for the darker parts of flesh and some of the shadow tones of flesh as well. So even though it's a very old fashioned colour, of all the colours that are available on the palette of colours that resemble things like burnt sienna, uh, like for instance Venetian red and so on, um, I think that's gone very, it's very old fashioned and you can't find it on the, on the sets anymore, but they should develop a set where you have the colours for portraiture. And that brings me to the next thing I was to going to talk to you about figurative work. Um, most people, of course, they think flesh colour is going to be the, the colour. It's not the colour at all. Here's a colour which I originally was pointing out to you. It's got um, cobalts in it. There's no way that that's a mixture of a blue and a pink. It's just got its own um, vivacity, hasn't it? It's gem-like and it's not lilac and it's not purple. It's called cobalt violet and it's about 38 euros and it's a, it's a series four. 
Um, the reason it's so expensive, again, is because it's ground from basic gemstones and semi-precious stones. So, But when I'm using it for, uh, for my particular paintings, um, I hardly ever use it in its pure form, like I would if I was a floral artist or whatever. I would use it um, tinted down with white and Naples yellow light to make a buff titanium for a lot of my flesh tones. I mean, you might think that they're actually quite pinkish in nature, but in actual fact, there's a huge amount of um, pale lilac in flesh tones that we don't really especially in Caucasian skin tones, you know. So there's no way that a purple from a dioxin purple range or the violets or the, um, any of those ranges will give you that sort of subtlety. As well as being very vibrant, it also, when it's muted down with its, com <coughs> its complementary, it's also an incredibly versatile flesh colour. And then mixed with the range of um, Terra Rosa, which is an artist's quality colour, it just gives you um, those luscious flesh tones, which you need. So I think an awful, I mean, in 20 minutes, obviously, you can't go through all the various things. But just to give you some information each time you, you come here is great, because it just helps to, for you to be able to give directions to your customers. So that's cobalt violet. It's a very important color for, for figurative paintings. What's also very important for people doing figurative paintings and for people doing art in terms of portraiture are the transparent, the range of transparent colours that you can get in the artist's colours, because those, those colours, you, you really don't know what they're for. If I'm doing landscape painting, I will want a deep brown, like a Van Dyke brown or a burnt umber, which I've tried to sort of show in those paintings. You want opaqueness when you're doing landscape painting for depth, you know. But when I'm doing a brown in a person's hair, I want a transparent brown. Does that stand to reason? Because hair is never a block of brown, it's usually kind of various tones of transparency. So if I'm, if I'm doing my figurative work and I'm using browns, it would be the transparent brown oxide or the gold ochre oxides and, and those kind of lighter ranges of colours which you can create depth by just putting a bit of indigo or putting in a little bit of uh, Payne's Grey if you have it. But what I'm saying is that when a person is starting off doing to do figurative work, they're not looking for a, a block opaque brown, they're looking for a transparent brown that they can manipulate into a block brown when they want to. So knowing what um, kind of subject matter that your customer or yourself are looking for helps to determine what kind of range you go for in the end. I have to say one small thing about the range of colours for figurative work as well, is that they tend to be on the more expensive line because of the subtlety of the colours. Like nobody will do portraiture and end up with um, a rainbow of colours. When somebody's doing portraiture, uh, old, fa old faces, young faces, um, you're, going to talk, you're talking about the subtlety of, of vivid colour. So um, I just wanted to point out as well that one of my own favourites, it's not a cheap colour at all, it's not a permanent rose because that will give me um, a primary colour. It's actually a colour with a very small, low tone of colour and it's called Rose Dore. It's very old fashioned. I wonder if you can see it there. Like those of you who are female, hold on a second, it's all female. Ah, <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, that's, I know that colour is about 35 or 36 euros, but that colour I use so much in portraiture just for the finishing touches almost to give a blush on the side of a cheekbone or um, to give, uh, you know sometimes when you're doing portraiture the ears can be quite pinkish without being pinkish, you know they're actually kind of luminous pink and so um, there's parts of the fingers as well that are quite luminous pink. So. I'm sure you can see it in some of the places that I've left it quite clear there. The luminous pink, by the way, is the Rose Dory. So the more you get into what your subject matter is and what you're trying to get out of the colours that you're doing, the more you'll be able to make proper choices for the, the types of paintings that you're going to be doing. Obviously, I brought in some of my landscape paintings because I wanted to show you some of the, um, the other scale, which is the opaques, the, um, the <sighs> I know if a lot of these would be olives sap greens out of the tube and so on. No, no problem at all. Okay, that's no problem. But I did promise these ladies um, a two minute thing about brushes. Okay. And, and it's literally just two minutes. Uh, are you bored? Sorry. Um, okay. I would just ask you um, to make sure that people who do oil painting don't buy the Galleria brushes or the synthetic brushes that are available on the market, including some of the cheaper range of brushes because the, the, um, the distilled turpentine and the sand store just melt them away and they just don't have the lifelong capacity. So you're talking about anything like if... Uh, these are the best types of brushes to get them, you know. Um, that's the first thing. 
Obviously, with small detail, um, I, I might just buy a small sabre brush or a sable look-alike brush, but it won't last very long to do small detail. Um, so we're talking about three different types of brushes here, and I had three of them just cleaned up, I think, just to show you. Um, yeah. If you're starting to give people direction about brushes, and I did that with my daughter a few months ago, even though I stole them back off her and she hasn't forgiven me. <laughs> okay, so um, forget about selling people Galleria brushes for oil painting because they don't last. People need a very big round brush for clouds. They also need it for backgrounds and so on. You can actually uh, extend this to a flat, flat brush if you wanted. There was somebody who gave me the flat brush earlier there. I'll just show you the flat brush. If you, if you really want to spend a lot of money, you can do the flat brush thing as well. But those four brushes really would be, somebody would get through four or five years of painting if they could have those four brushes. This one is um, for just basic covering, um, like a ground or whatever. This one is for clouds. You cannot get a round soft cloud without using a round soft brush, which doesn't have any edges, so you need this for blending. This one is a filbert brush, and it's the most undervalued brush, I think, unless you've actually gone to classes. It's got a little um, bishop's hat shape on the top, and the metal part of it is flattened. So it's great versatility, because when you're starting off with painting, for instance, um, you can fill in areas, and you can also make lines with it by turning it on its side. And most of the time, people can get an awful lot of versatility out of it. So the size two is the one that I would normally get, and they never have enough of them in stock. So um, that's a really big seller for me because I'd, I'd go in and I'd be looking through the, the, ki the kits and they'd have loads of number fours, sixes and eights, but they wouldn't have a lot of number two. So, and the number one round is essential for small detail. Like in the landscape painting there, I would have used this type of brush for the striae on the water. I would have used this type of brush on the, um, the cloud to make the softness of the cloud. I would have used this for most of the smaller um, middle distance parts of the painting and I would have used this round brush here for some of the small details of the trees. So, I mean, if you're talking about keeping it basic, those are four brushes that you absolutely essentially need. That's the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.